Hello, and welcome everyone to this first conversation between the German National Library and Library and Archives Canada. Welcome to all those watching from across Germany, Canada, and around the world. And welcome especially to our guests who learned about this panel through the Frankfurt Book Fair. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Anishinaabe people, the caretakers of this land in the past, the present, and future. I'm aware that people attending are all living and working in different Indigenous territories and homelands, and I invite you to take a moment to acknowledge internally the territory on which you have the privilege of living. If you're not aware of the history of the land on which you live, I invite you to take a moment today to research and learn about that land. German, uh, the German National Library and Library and Archives Canada is organizing a four-part virtual conversation series over the next year um, <clears throat> to highlight Canada being the guest of honor in 2021 for the Frankfurt Book Fair. Please keep your eyes on both the German National Library and Library and Archives Canada websites for upcoming dates as we announce those events. Today, our panelists include Frank Schulze, the Director General of the German National Library, and Leslie Weir, the Librarian and Archivist of Canada. I'll start by asking Frank to introduce himself, followed by Leslie. All right, Alex, thank you for that. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm really glad and excited that we have this uh, first of a series of conversations between Library and Archives of Canada and the German National Library. And I'm glad to give some introduction, introduction about the German National Library, a little bit of history and a little bit of strategy. Um, the German National Library, or DNB, as we abbreviated in Germany, is a federal institution uh, under public law and is funded from the budget of the Minister of State for Culture and Media. It's the central archival library in Germany and we collect, document, and archive all publications and sound recordings uh, issued or published in Germany since 1913, which is a uh, quite young age for a national library, especially in Europe. Um, the collection is supplemented by the holdings of the German Music Archive, the German Museum of Books and Writing, and the German Exile Archive in 19. 33 to 1945. So it's a kind of holding institution uh, for these archives and museums. Excellent. And let's. Yeah, it's a quite young. Yeah. Sorry. Frank. Sorry. <laughs> Leslie, would you mind introducing yourself? No. It's. Hi. Um, I'm Leslie Weir. I'm the Librarian and Archivist of Canada. And I am thrilled to be here with Frank Schulze today to launch the lead up to Frankfurt 2021 when Canada will be the country of honor. Uh, I think it's a very exciting topic that we're going to be discussing over these four sessions that we were planning. Digitization is really critical, especially in these days today with the pandemic worldwide. It just underlines the importance of access to digital content to everyone around the world. Uh, so thank you, Alex. I guess we'll move on to the um, main show. Exactly, and uh, I suppose I should also introduce myself. So my name is Alex Haggart, and I'll be your moderator for this discussion today. I'm a project manager and user experience designer at Library and Archives Canada, and my team develops digital services, so making it easier for our clients to access and interact with the LAC collection online. And one more thing for our audience, uh, we want to hear from you. At any time during today's session, I invite you to ask questions in the chat on YouTube. We'll select a few audience questions for Leslie and Frank to discuss at, uh, towards the end of today's panel. So Frank, um, let's talk a little bit more about the institutions and the role they play. Can you tell us a bit more about the German National Library and um, how it operates in this rapidly changing world? Yeah, sure. And um, sorry, I'm so excited about our young history that I uh, just was uh, taken away <laughs> by my introduction. Um, so it's it's a young institution, but um, still it's it's not a typical one. I think it was uh, founded in, in 1913, as I already said, by the German Publisher and Bookseller Association as the Deutsche Bücherei in Leipzig, um, not by the German state, 
So I think this relates very well to the Frankfurt Book Fair here, which is also run by the German Publisher and Bookseller Association. It was only later in, in the 1930s that it was financed by the German state. And I think it really reflects well um, the German history as um, in 1946, with the division of Germany, um, there was a new founded Deutsche Bibliothek in Frankfurt am Main, where we currently are. Um, so, and then um, two libraries, so to say, one in the east, one in the west. And only in 1990, with the reunification of Germany, the Deutsche Bücherei and the Deutsche Bibliothek were merged into a single institution again. Um, at that time, that was a very far-sighted decision to remain both locations in Leipzig and Frankfurt, and it showed quite some political sensibility. It is very interesting that uh, the name Deutsche Nationalbibliothek or German National Library was only coined in 2006 when a new law uh, came into force. Um, so it is, was a considerable debate um, about which, uh, if the German National Library should be coined like that. But we can talk about that later. Um, the strategy, um, I will only touch it very briefly, that we um, currently um, develop has an umbrella uh, which we uh, produced and published back in 2016, which covers the period until 2025. It's our strategic compass. It um, describes the environment, the challenges, and our guiding values and principles. And uh, thus offers the starting point for our strategy process. And we are in the midst of the next, so to say, strategy cycle here uh, for the period to 2021 to 2024. Um, we call these our strategic priorities, which really flesh out the strategic compass. And the essence of our current strategic priorities can be summarized in three sentences. In order to fulfill our memory function, we are expanding the digital collections and developing attractive and user-friendly forms of presentation. We invest in digital indexing processes as well as in cross-disciplinary networking, cooperation, and an understanding between culture and science. These priorities are flanked by our further development as a learning organization. The long-term goal, which really goes way beyond 2025, is that our collections will be completely available in digital form. This is a path that we have already begun to take when we transition from card catalogs to the so-called electronic data processing of cataloging, and which we are now pursuing in the sense that we put a complete digital layer on top of our collections. But I think we can talk about that in the next section. Wow, that's uh, very interesting. The German National Library has such a storied history, pardon the pun. Um, now, uh, I have a couple of questions actually in uh, response to just what she just told us about the history of the German National Library. And um, you talked a little bit about this compass, uh, strategic compass 2025. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how you built that plan? Um, you know, who had a role in building it and why did you choose 2025 as sort of your target year? Yeah, well, um, I think it was a very broad and participatory process. So we had a lot of um, world cafes and, and interactive sessions, I think, with um, a lot of the staff here at uh, Frankfurt and Leipzig and with focus groups outside uh, the library uh, with our boards and um, so the strategic um, uh, decision groups. Um, and I think back in, in 2015, when we did that, I think the 10 year period seemed, um, I think the right time um, where we could define some kind of developments, but on the other hand, be sure that it wouldn't be too, too vague or too, too opaque, so to say, to make some, um, 
assumptions about how things would develop. And I think um, looking back, well, I only came uh, to the German National Library at the beginning of this year, but looking back on, on the strategy process so far, I think this has proven very, uh, very well. And uh, so a lot of the assumptions that we made back in, in 2015 have come into existence. Now, Leslie, uh, would you tell us a little bit more about Library and Archives Canada as an organization and what's on the horizon? Happy to do that, uh, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, Canada is rather unique because we merged our National Library, which had been founded in 1953, and the National Archives, which was founded in 1872, to create Can Library and Archives Canada in just in 2004. I, uh, on April 22nd. And we did that so that we could provide Canadians with a single point of access to our collections and our services in person and online. Now, unlike the German National Library, we're a federal agency that actually reports to Parliament through the Minister of Canadian Heritage. So Libraries and Archives Canada has a very broad mandate to acquire, preserve, and provide access to Canada's documentary heritage. Our vast collections, which have been assembled over nearly 150 years, include more than 50 million items that range from books to government records, private archives, art, sound and audio recordings, all the way to photographs. It includes as well more than 5 billion megabytes of electronic documents that come from both materials that we've digitized but also from digital born records. Our two public service points outside of Ottawa, Canada's capital, share space with local institutions. So we have um, a service point in the Vancouver Public Library in British Columbia in the West on the Pacific Ocean. And then 6,000 kilometers to the East, we have a service point at the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on the Atlantic Ocean. We're also doing something rather daring with our main branch in Canada's national capital. In 2025, we will be moving in with our neighbor, the Ottawa Public Library, who is the fourth largest public library in Canada. And we are uh, constructing a new library together. It's very exciting for us because we expect that we will see, even hopefully post COVID, some 1.7 million visitors a year, which is a slight increase from the 30,000 that we currently welcome to our public service point in Ottawa. And we're expecting quite a different demographic. Uh, we're hoping that we'll see children, youth, new Canadians, entrepreneurs, um, and many others that'll join our tr more traditional users um, that are academics, researchers, historians, and genealogists. Listening to people in the various demographics is really important to us. So traditionally, uh, we do nurture and support relationships with uh, the library and archival communities across Canada, but we also need to find ways to engage with all sectors of society, especially those that have traditionally been marginalized and underrepresented. This is really important to LAC, that we remain relevant to all Canadians as we set priorities. At LAC, we actually have an Indigenous advisory circle and a youth advisory council that guide us in engaging with and supporting these two important communities to complement the input that we get from our professional advisory committees. This year, we are launching a process of developing a vision for how LAC should look in 10 years from now. So just like the German National Library, 10 years seems like a good number. Um, the goal is to provide us with a framework for planning our future with a user experience lens. And we want to use that lens in the way we develop our services and enhancing the access to our collections. For example, Vision 2030 will look at how our famous new library and our virtual services and collections can create synergies to create a more vibrant and relevant um, institution supporting Canada as it strives towards 
a civil society. So as we move forward in developing LAC's vision for 2030, we're creating this framework for the future to ensure that LAC meets the needs of a variety of users and communities while expanding our digital content, making Canadian documentary heritage accessible and relevant to everyone in Canada and around the world. Thank you, Alex. That's wonderful. Um, it's great to hear about the exciting new facility and the work that's being done to um, prepare uh, ourselves at LAC to support all different kinds of demographics and different types of users. Um, now, one thing that is on the top of everyone's mind is COVID-19 and the implications it has for our society today. So a quick question for you, uh, as COVID-19 continues to encourage, you know, more remote learning and working and events like this one, how will LAC shift its in-person service model towards increased consultation, access and services online? Well, I think, I think this is critical. Um, in Canada, we're a very large country. And so even without COVID, um, the imperative of having online collections and services um, is extremely important to make us relevant to Canadians. And COVID puts a spotlight on this. And we know that we'll be living with COVID for the foreseeable future. And so we are looking at how we can increase our digital presence and create um, more access to our services online and, and as well how people can perhaps do more with what we provide in terms of our collections. So maybe providing some tools that will help people, you know, overlay um, different kinds of data to create different kinds of experience and 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 knowledge, in fact. So this this is quite a focus for us. We're also looking at more virtual events like this one, looking at how we could do more virtual exhibits and have what we do online complement what we do um, in person. And we have reopened our public services in Vancouver and in uh, Winnipeg. And now with a resurgence we're enjoying in the national capital region, um, we've delayed restarting our services in Ottawa, but we will hope to do so in the not too distant future. Uh, but sadly, it will be by appointment only initially. All right, thank you. I think underneath these strategic processes, um, what really is important that as an institution with, with all these people, um, you get a sense um, that you can sort of say create your future and that it's um, only a kind of a guideline, like a corridor that you're uh, describing, that you're creating. And as you go through it through time, um, you're doing some changes. And um, so it's, it's kind, I think the, the most important thing uh, for us is to feel empowered by this process that we really can change and create our future. That's why we um, entitled our strategic priorities for the next four years. Um, we are a cultural memory of the past and the future. Um, you, you have to think about it. What, what is the memory of the future? But it means exactly that, that we are in in a kind of position to, to shape that. Wonderful. And then Leslie? Maybe I'll jump in here. Um, I, I think it's actually quite similar to uh, what, what Frank has expressed. And that is that for us, Vision 2030 will be a framework and it'll be quite high level and it has to be a living plan. Um, if you create a strategic plan, and uh, you know you celebrate its creation and then you put it on the side of your desk and it is not actually really um, uh, triggering and, and supporting and create helping you create your future um, you know then it's nothing but a dead document and I think um, at LAC we do uh, three-year plans which are more tactical in nature so they let us kind of know the steps we need to take to achieve our immediate objectives but they need to be in a larger framework so that we actually know what our institution could and should look like in 10 years down the road. And so um, like the German National Library, 
we will be reassessing on a regular basis and touching base with our staff, our users, and our community, um, you know, to be able to um, ensure that the plan is living and responding to the needs of, of all of the stakeholders. Absolutely. So it's so critical, um, you know, to have a map, but be ready to take the right paths that come up as you stumble upon them. Wonderful. Okay, so let's shift into the second part of our discussion here, really talking about digitization, um, priorities and processes. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more um, from both of you and what your institutions are doing on those topics. Um, again, everyone's thinking these days about what can I access from my own home? What can I access on my computer? And so I'd like to start, maybe Frank, you can tell us a little bit more about what the German National Library is doing in the realm of digitization and increasing digital access at your institution. Right. And I think expectations is, uh, that's a crucial issue. Um, to get everything um, at home and everything, so to say, with a complete open access license, that is a challenge for a legal deposit library, at least in Germany or in Europe, but I, I can uh, imagine in Canada as well. Just to, to give a few numbers here, um, our collections is about 40 million media items, uh, about which around 8 million are, are digital, are born, and of these 8 million, only 1.3 million um, have licenses that really allow to use them outside our premises. And um, as you can imagine, uh, we really hope to, um, to say, to push um, copyright laws to the boundaries to, to give more access to that. But I'm quite sure it will never be our whole collection. So um, part of our collection will still, although being digital, be bound to our premises. That is um, why we still have this goal um, of doing everything digital, um, but so to say, enable people to interact what we call our DNB lab, um, so to say, on our premises. And um, so to say, either build collections there and work with um, digital algorithms, tool, and things like that on our premises. We have uh, some example for that currently. Um, for example, um, topic-specific language comparisons between blogs and websites on the one hand and daily newspapers on the other. Um, the use of pseudonyms in, in novels or the investigation of the foreign in German and Austrian cookbooks from 1950 to 1980. So all these are scientific projects that uh, take place, let's say, with collections that are built uh, within our um, digital environment. Um, but on the other hand, we try to um, enlarge this group of objects that can really be worked with from home. Uh, we have a, a service uh, for our licensing out of commerce works, which really works well. So um, just anyone can um, go for a license there. And um, if um, this uh, process is um, gone through in a positive way and, and most of them are because uh, we're speaking about uh, books and uh, publications that range from 1930 to say 1950. Um, then these um, works can be made available to everyone. So it's, it's a kind of open access there. Um, but um, all in all, um, what we try to combine at the moment is um, that we have these thematic uh, approaches, like I, I just gave you these examples, and we combine it with a more systematic approach. 
um, this will be one of our main focuses of the next strategic um, period that we have before us, that we really begin to digitize our collection systematically starting with 1913 and um, trying, so to say, to close all the gaps that we have in this digital layer on top of our collections. Um, this kind of formation of a digital layer um, makes the analog objects in the collections not obsolete or less valuable, but it is, in our perspective, it is a necessary layer to enable the use in all facets and to really um, sort of create uh, the possibility of participations to work and acquire these objects, because only with these compilation of collections or corpora, it is possible um, to, to gain new insights and to um, deploy methods of text and data mining or machine learning. Um, it is simply not possible anymore just with analog methods to really um, research all these vast collections that we have or that uh, other libraries have. So I think um, it is a kind of inevitable um, development that we have to really build a layer uh, which can be used by research, by culture, by the society at large um, in order to gain new knowledge and new insight. And this can flow back into the collections. So I think in a nutshell, this is um, the digitization strategy um, of the German National Library. And we are only uh, a part in a big network of institutions here um, because um, it is um, so that we, we are depending on research institutions on the one hand, on larger platforms like the German Digital Library or DDB which is the, the national portal for all cultural heritage institutions. And this feeds into the Europeana, which is then the European portal, um, including the holdings of thousands and thousands of cultural heritage and scientific institutions in Europe. And only through these platforms, we can really go to an interaction and engagement with society at large. So to say, um, the German National Library is uh, strong, but only one hub in a network of cultural memory and scientific information resources institutions and tries to shape together this environment of cultural memory. Thank you, Frank. That is very interesting. Um, I especially appreciate kind of talking about the uh, challenges and opportunities that copyright presents um, and hearing about kind of how the German National Library fits into that larger picture of partnering and collaborating with other institutions as well. Now, a question for you. You described that the German National Library is going to digitize its holdings on a systematic um, basis. So starting with the beginning of the collection in the year 1913, right? Um, how long does the German National Library envision that will take? Um, why did you decide on a chronological approach as opposed to some other kind of um, you know, prioritization method? Um, I'd be really interested to hear. Mm. Well, we haven't put in a, a concrete date to the end of that process. And as I already said, it is a combination of um, different approaches. So um, in the past, we only had this thematic approach that we said, well, if a researcher comes to us and says, well, I want to investigate about um, dime novels of the 1930s, we would digitize a collection of, let's say, 5,000 or 10,000 of, of these dime novels. Um, and so we have a lot of digital collections already there. And we will go on like that. But now 
we combine this approach with this more systematic and um, I think um, it's the smaller numbers, um, the more we go back to the past. And um, I think it's easier um, to go for these licensing issues, uh, like I said, for this out of commerce work. So uh, our hope is that with that approach, we will, so to say, uh, contribute much more content, which then can really be um, used outside our premises. That's great. I'm sure it'll... But still, um, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we're, we're not quite sure when our digital collection will be complete, when we have digitized all these 40 million works. So that will be part maybe of the next uh, strategic period, then from 2025 to 2035. Interesting. And I'm sure that um, it'll help with kind of setting those expectations so that people know what's coming and can get excited about what's being digitized next with this systematic approach as well. Now, um, Leslie, will you tell us a little bit more about LAC's approach to digitization and digital access to collections? Happy to, Alex. Uh, thank you. So obviously, as a national institution, um, digitization is essential in ensuring that people across Canada and internationally have access to our collections. Um, the gateway to our digital access is the Libraries and Archives Canada website. And last year we had um, something over 4 million visits. We also have quite an extensive social media presence. Um, so we're very active in Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Flickr. We have podcasts and we have a blog. And these outlets really enable us to showcase some of the unique and obscure and even unusual items in our collections and uh, to reach a wider audience. Last year, we digitized um, something over 3.4 million images. And this was just a high, a small part of the huge volume of our collection that has yet to be digitized. So um, it's a bit challenging in that um, we continue to receive analog records as well as born digital. And we are pretty well maintaining three to four percent of our collection that is digitized because even with everything we digitize annually our analog ingest uh, dwarfs uh, that so um, that continues to be a challenge for us um, that said we do have um, we know that we can't do this alone so like in Germany, there is a national approach in terms of the National Heritage Digitization Strategy and Libraries and Archives Canada was one of the founding institutions for that strategy that brings together cultural institutions in Canada, looking at how we can digitize uh, the, the cultural heritage uh, across the country. We also have two important initiatives at Libraries and Archives Canada that I'd like to speak about today and that is our DigiLab and our CoLab. So DigiLab allows community-based groups and individuals, as well as academics and genealogists, to engage in digitizing our collections when accessing our physical collections um, in Ottawa. It's a hands-on facility for users that allows them to digitize and contextualize LAC collections of value to their communities or studies or research. And then those are made accessible to the general public. So the goal of the DigiLab is to make available a range, wide range of materials from our vast collections that might not otherwise be digitized in the short or midterm. So by working with and meeting the needs of a variety of users and communities, we extend, um, we expand our digital content while making our digital um, documentary heritage more accessible and relevant. So since 2017, when it was launched, the DigiLab has resulted in more than 90,000 images being digitized and made publicly available. The CoLab, on the other hand, is our crowdsourcing tool that lets the public transcribe, tag, translate, describe digitized items from our collections. And this initiative really does increase the digital content of our collections in terms of giving people much more accessibility and discoverability to those collections. 
for us though, um, digitization can't just be about technology. It's got to be about the people. And earlier I referred to the need and the priority that we have to work with underrepresented communities. So I'd like to highlight three projects that aim to make indigenous content digitally available. So the first project called We Are Here Sharing Stories aims to digitize and describe the hundreds of thousands of indigenous related items in Libraries and Archives Canada holdings. While the second project, Listen, Hear Our Voices, supports digitization of records in First Nations, Inuit, and the Métis Nation communities. Finally, the majority of individuals depicted in the images and photographs in LAC's collections were never identified. They, and so, and many archival descriptions are absent for these materials, or worse, they reflect the bias and attitudes of non-Indigenous society of the time. So Libraries and Archives Canada has partnered with Indigenous communities on a project called a Project Naming that enables the Indigenous peoples themselves to engage in the identification of the places and people in the photographs from Libraries and Archives Canada collections, thus filling in the gaps and making those materials more accessible and acknowledging the individuals that were actually in those pictures. And while it began as a small project focused in the north with the Inuit, uh, we had, I think, a target of 500 images um, to be um, described in the first year. It's now spread across the country with all of our Indigenous uh, communities, and we have uh, now described more than 10,000 photographs. So Canada is a huge country. I mean, we have 37.5 million people spread across 3.8 million square kilometers, and it is 6,000 kilometers from coast to coast. So our challenge is really to be accessible to all, and it's through digital collections and services that will enable us in accomplishing this. And as highlighted earlier, during these days of COVID, it becomes so much more important. Wonderful. Um, those initiatives sound very interesting and uh, project naming especially and collab are close to my heart as projects I've worked on at LAC. Now, a quick question for you related to this digital content, right? It's only as useful as its ability to be discovered. So can you talk a little bit about the search tools that are available at LAC to help researchers access the material or maybe even just kind of serendipitously discover it or explore it? Well, that is an interesting question because, of course, we are we are all dealing with rapid change in, in technology and um, with the important role the web plays and the discoverability. And many of us do actually have legacy systems where we are describing or have described perhaps for decades our collections. Um, so at LAC, we've actually uh, developed uh, an initiative around uh, collection search that allows uh, people to search across our collections, because of course, being a national library and a national archives um, and having different um, practices in um, describing items uh, across those professions, it does create a challenge in ensuring that our users can actually find materials from across our collections. And um, we're, we're quite proud of the work we're doing on collection search in which we're actually using, with a capital A, an agile approach where we are doing iterative development that is very focused on the user experience and users being able to actually find the materials in our collections at the same time that we have a rather uh, challenging plans uh, ahead of us to look at replacing and updating our legacy systems. Very interesting. Um, now, I have a question for you both. Now, you both talked a little bit about technology and the use of technology uh, and systems or, or technological products to help uh, clients navigate the collection, and navigate these online tools. Um, is there a particular, um, you know, new or something on the horizon digital technology that you're most excited about the use of in your institutions? I'll ask Frank to go first. Well, um... Before the excitement, I think uh, Leslie gave a perfect um, 
catchphrase that's legacy systems. Uh, I think um, all these big libraries and national libraries have this, and uh, we always have to balance, so to say, how we can evolve and develop those legacy systems and, and build um, new tools and services um, on top of that or um, in a, a side of that. So um, I think uh, what will be um, exciting in the future uh, will be, well, it will be manifold. Uh, I, I concentrate on text and then I will say a little bit maybe on, on, on audio and, and video. Um, with the text, I think um, the exciting thing is really to build these digital layers. Um, and we started, for example, with the table of contents. This is unproblematic from, from a, a legal point of view. So we already have digitized more than 2 million uh, table of contents, and we will digitize another 2 or 3 million. And we just integrated that in, so to say, in our search engines, which is on top of our catalog. So you cannot only then search, so to say, for the um, conventional metadata, but also for all these authors and titles and other uh, items in, in this uh, table of contents, which, which is, um, I think, great for most users because they, they can, so to say, look deeper into books. Uh, you could say with Google, it, it's not exciting anymore, but it's it's done in a structured way, and I think that is um, the thing that Google has never provided, um, and it's done, so to say, from from a domain expert point of view, and I think with um, OCR and digitization, we will we will add to these layers to really produce structured um, text and information, so that you, for example, can search what. Uh, a headline uh, means or uh, a caption below a, a, a figure or a picture in a book. Uh, but I think these are things that um, are technically possible at the moment, but they are not within sort of the productivity in our catalog, at least not at the German National Library, but I'm excited to hear maybe more from Canada. Um, I think um, to come to other domains, for example, with pictures. Uh, I think there are a lot of uh, exciting tools available there to make um, automatic, um, so to say, picture entity recognition. We all know that from, from Google and from uh, Apple and all these uh, vendors. If you have your pictures on the smartphone, you can search by picture content, for example. Uh, but we will do that from a, a cultural and scientific perspective, much more domain order oriented and then combined with uh, domain specific, um, what we call ontologies, that you really have this domain specific language attached to this um, picture detection. And hopefully we will see some of that uh, within the German digital library and the Europeana in the coming years. Very exciting, absolutely. Lastly, would you like to jump in? Well, I'm kind of interested to see just what impact uh, sort of computer learning and artificial intelligence may have now that we're moving into digitizing the majority of our collections in I think all cultural institutions around the world, it just creates huge opportunities, but also there are pitfalls and concerns because we know that bias is a major issue um, where you are using any kind of um, approach. Uh, as we know, data is only as good as the those that created the data. And so I think it's something that we have to be very mindful of and aware of, but I think it could be a very powerful tool for us to really enable more discoverability and better access to our collections. And uh, at the, the other thing I'm kind of interested in, in terms of services, is I'd really like to see us move into uh, using augmented reality, uh, more immersive kinds of technology. I, I think about the opportunity for people to actually experience moments in history um, by being placed inside of them, um, either in their homes or perhaps at the new library that we're building with the Ottawa Public Library. 
um, so that we can make history quite real. And maybe it's not even history. Maybe it's about life today. And maybe it gives people an opportunity to know what it's like to live in, in the north, in Canada, in Nunavut or the Northwest Territories or the Yukon, um, where, you know, you're perhaps a, an urban liver living in, in Montreal or Toronto or Ottawa, and you really don't know what it's like to live in a remote or rural community. And I think that in Canada, because we're such a large country with such a small population and we're so spread out, that sometimes we don't understand the wide variations in the experiences that people have in our country. And I think that there are new tools that are being developed that we can leverage in terms of creating these enhanced experiences for people. I completely agree. I think the opportunities are just fascinating. Um, when it comes to you know extended reality, whether it's uh, virtual reality or augmented reality, that sort of thing, uh, it's such a sort of um, cutting edge um, technology that's certainly part of all of our futures, as well as uh, like both of you mentioned, this idea of using algorithms and uh, machine learning to um, you know navigate the data in these collections, and especially as we move into digitally born material more and more, um, there's so much metadata that goes with every single piece of our collections. So that's very interesting. Now, as we move into this tail end of our time together today, I'd just like to remind the audience that you can ask questions in the YouTube chat. Um, we'll just take these last 10 minutes to have a conversation together. Um, and if there are any questions from the audience, we'll, we'll move to them. So uh, first, I have a question for both of you. Um, and really, I think it's, again, at the top of everyone's minds. It's, it's what's um, you know, most prevalent today for many of us is COVID-19. Um, I'd like to hear just a little bit more about the effects and challenges that the pandemic has had on your organization, um, not necessarily just you know, your collection and your access, but maybe even um, the way that you work, uh, your staff, your processes, um, and what are you doing to adapt in this challenging time? Uh, Frank, I'll ask you to go first. All right, thanks. Um, yeah, um, maybe to to relate a little bit about, so to say, the history of COVID-19, we really had to shut down our premises on March 18th this year and we only reopened uh, 5th of May. So we really had a complete shutdown of all our operations, not only so to say the reading rooms, but most of our internal operations as well. And um, this was, I think, like a kind of shock, but uh, um, it also was, um, when we reflected about that, um, a kind of catalyst uh, for doing things more digitally. Um, fortunately, when we had to shut down in the mid of March, um, around 56% of our staff already had uh, the technical equipment and the means to work remotely. And we tried to expand that during the next few weeks from mid-March um, to about, I would say, 70, 75%. Uh, at a national library, not everyone can work from home. Um, so um, we had to, um, so to say, to make it possible, again, for some staff to come back to the premises that worked out quite well. And we had a lot of discussions and conversations. And I think uh, we had really an atmosphere of working together at that time. So a lot of things were possible. Um, and we had, so to say, um, unconventional solutions for a lot of things that seemed impossible um, a year ago or so. Um, for example, that we um, did almost all of our um, cataloging just on the digital objects. Uh, we, um, we get a lot of um, our publications as well in, in analog as in digital form. And um, before the pandemic, it would have been impossible to think about not not doing the cataloging with the printed uh, versions of the works, but um, this changed um, over time. So I, I really think um, 
it was a kind of catalyst for a lot of processes and and we still are working on that uh, when we see now uh, at the moment in germany at least that the second wave might be coming and um, there will be more restrictions again um, in terms of the collections um, I think this is this was really hard that uh, with the pandemic we had to to limit access to our reading rooms um, and um, we had um, kind of a reservation system which we opened two two weeks in advance and um, Roly Keating from the British Library when I told him um, this he said yeah you're like rock stars your tickets are sold within seconds or minutes and it's just like that, uh, but it's not because we are so famous, because uh, it's because we we offer so so limited amount of, of tickets. Uh, it's only 450 per day in Frankfurt, for example, which is only a third of of the users we had per day uh, in normal times. So I think this is um, really um, so to say, a, yeah, a backdraw or. Um, which we have um, not really um, some kind of solution to overcome because you have to work on the premises with all our collections and this is limited with the COVID pandemic. Certainly. Leslie, what about at LAC? So at LAC, of course, the pandemic was announced on the 11th of March. On the 13th of March, um, all of the national museums, the National Gallery and Libraries and Archives Canada agreed together that we would close our public services the following day on the 14th. And then on the 16th of March, staff were asked to come in to the premises to gather whatever they needed and then go home. Um, we didn't actually have a sufficient um, access uh, through our, our uh, VPN for all staff, but we quickly geared it up. Um, and in fact, I would suggest that what you're looking at right now on the screen really does kind of highlight um, our life at LAC right now. I'm actually at uh, one of our facilities uh, in Gatineau in the National Capital Region, and Alex is working from home. So in fact, we, had our, uh, we uh, have not reopened our public services since completely since March 14th, uh, by appointment or otherwise. Um, and in fact, the majority of our staff are working remotely from home. Um, on August 12th, well, we began our first phase in in July 2nd in Winnipeg uh, for our facility around military records because we needed to meet our obligations for uh, Veterans Canada. And um, then on August 12th, we be, we brought in, uh, brought back about 160 staff of our thousand um, that we have on strength who could not do their jobs remotely. And uh, those people are still on site, um, but um, wearing masks in all public spots. Um, they're only unmasked at their own workstation we make sure that no one's workstation is next to someone else's workstation who's in at the same time. We have very, very um, strong protocols in place. Um, we have actually only had one of our extended staff uh, team uh, confirmed uh, a confirmed case of COVID, and that was uh, a, a member of our security staff, which who worked at night. Um, but Canada is well into the second wave, and Ottawa. Um, and uh, uh, Quebec, uh, where we have facilities, are hot spots. So, in fact, for us, living with COVID is a new reality. People are working at home. Uh, the public are accessing our collections through our website. Um, we have very limited public services, uh, as I mentioned, in Vancouver and in um, uh, Winnipeg. And we are hoping to be able to bring back by uh, you know, people being able to come on site uh, by appointment only, similar to a reservation system at our uh, colleagues institution at the German National Library. Um, because we've been so disrupted and have not been able to return, um, one of the big challenges is just trying to address how we do keep our business moving while we are living with COVID. 
um, because the impact on the schools and on daycare have been quite massive. And so, um, and on our nursing homes, uh, where of course we've we've they've been very hard hit by COVID. So all of our our, our team members who have children, who have parents, or or other elderly relatives um, are you know finding it is quite challenging. Um, and as we move into this second wave, um, you know, things had been loosened up a little bit. People felt things were going a little bit back to normal, um, but they were not as widely, I think, um, uh, loosened up as, as, as they have been in, in Germany, probably due to the cases that we've continued to have. And the fact that we are right next door with the longest border of any country in the world between the United States and Canada, and the United States uh, is having a more challenging time um, dealing with COVID with more than 200,000 deaths. Um, so we're very cognizant of that. Um, our borders are still closed and uh, um, we're all working together. And I would say that we are, I'll just mention one last thing. We're, we're doing a pilot and I mentioned this because it relates to something Frank brought up. Um, initially we, we uh, dealt with our backlog in description and cataloging uh, around uh, our digital content. Um, and I think uh, we did great strides in that. And now we're actually doing a pilot where something that would be inconceivable before COVID, we are letting our catalogers come in uh, one day a week um, and they are gathering the materials, the physical analog, yes, books, and they are packing them up and they are taking them to their homes to do the description there. They, uh, there are protocols in place. You know, they're they're not stopping at the grocery store on the way home, um, and they're they're not cataloging the items in the kitchen. You know, next to their fruit bowl. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting experiment, and uh, you know, really everyone's come together to look at how we can support people, um, both both uh, socially. Um, and also professionally. And uh, it, it's quite amazing to see people rise to this occasion. But I think fatigue is, is setting in because it's, it's been a long haul uh, since March 11th. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, like you mentioned, experimentation at times like these is necessary. But we adapt uh, to our environments and uh, supporting each other will be the way forward. Um, absolutely, in, in both of our situations. Um, I have, we were running out of time, but just I'd love to ask each of you in one sentence um, from a digital standpoint, thinking about the digital, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing libraries or your institutions today and the biggest opportunity ahead? Frank? All right. Um, I think I'd like to start with the uh, opportunity. Um, I think the biggest opportunity is, is really that we as a community of memory institutions can actively embrace and shape um, the possibilities of digitizations and make cultural heritage more visible, more accessible, and more editable to a lot of different communities. And I think, um, yeah, this also is the challenge. Um, to really open it up and make it or yeah, deliver it or render it in formats that can be edited by different communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leslie? No, so, I'll jump in. Um, I'd actually say for cultural institutions in Canada, the biggest challenge is actually the biggest challenge for Canada. And that is that we don't have broadband available in every community in Canada. We have many, many remote uh, isolated communities that uh, simply don't have high speed access. And in fact, we have many people in large urban centers who uh, are have nots, even though it's it's available, it's, it's simply not costly. It's not available within their means. So I think it's a major challenge because we can make all the content available that we want to, but if people actually can't access that material in their homes and, and in their communities, then that I think is a major, major issue. And I, we're, we're certainly working together um, and um, encouraging investment in those areas in, in Canada. Um, at the same time, I think COVID may actually be a silver lining 
for cultural institutions and the understanding of the impact and the importance of their content being digitally available. And, you know, maybe we will see additional investment that helps us get much more of our content accessible to um, our communities and help us develop those tools that Frank and I have talked about um, to make sure that everything's even more discoverable. And I think that many groups are having think tanks looking at just how they can collaborate across cultural institutions to reinvent libraries and archives and galleries and museums in the post COVID world. Wonderful. I think that's a really nice spot to wrap up our conversation today. You know, there are challenges and opportunities to head ahead and we will get through them together by working together. Now, um, I'd like to say thank you to both of our panelists, Frank Schultz and Leslie Weir for your time and sharing your insight and your thoughts with us today. I'd also like to thank our audience members for participating in this virtual event. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of today's event, this is only the first of a four part virtual conversation series that'll take place over the next year between the German National Library and Library and Archives Canada. Our next event in the series will take place in February, 2021 just a, a few months away. So please stay tuned and watch the LAC and German National Library websites for updates. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, everyone. This has been fun. It has. Yeah, thank you.